Everyone in this room represents a mina of some sort, a blessing of some sort. Uh, whether it's money, whether your mina comes through money or your, it's come through spiritual gifting or it comes through talents and abilities. I want you to know today that whatever blessing you received is a blessing that Jesus wants you to share. He does not want you to wrap your handkerchief up, put your blessing in your pocket. He does not want you to just be all about your own career. He does not want you just to be all about making sure you leave inheritance for your own children. He doesn't want you just to be about your own safety, your own health, your own wealth, your own welfare. He wants you to be blessed, well, and healed, and whole, and then he wants you to share others the story of how you became well and whole and bring them into wholeness. God doesn't just want to heal you. He wants to heal others through you. If your blessing is money, the growth of your money had better be more than just in your own savings account. If your blessing is personality, the growth of your blessing better be more than just your own popularity. If your blessing is spiritual gifts, then the growth of your blessing should be better for others than even it is for you. The blessing of God are always meant, the blessings are always meant to fill us up, but they're also meant to spill out and make a mess. So whether it's money, resources, talent, personality, gifting, make sure your blessings are making a mess somewhere. Understand that when something spills over, it makes a mess. Anybody here? Sorry, I have to pull up my jeans. I'm losing so much weight, I can't hardly. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to come out and stick my tongue out, and you're going to go, that's a zipper. That was such a bad joke. Pardon my attempt at levity. Okay. When you overfill your cereal bowl, why is it that when you go to the refrigerator at midnight for a, a little bowl of cereal and you pour those frosted flakes in there, how is it that when you're pouring the milk, it can always find one of those frosted flakes just at the right angle to splash it everywhere? Have you noticed that? It's an art to not make a mess when you're pouring milk into Frosted Flakes. God wants this blessing that you've got that's come to your life. He wants it to spill over on others. Isn't that awesome? Oh, what, is, what do you say you let your blessing become a mess? It's a beautiful thing. Make sure that your blessing is spilling over and spreading to other people. Remember, you have inherited Abraham's blessing. Share it. Through us, all nations will be blessed. And, and here's the key to all of this. While the blessing is meant to benefit us, it's also meant to benefit others, but it ultimately benefits God. Remember that the reason the nobleman in the parable was so upset because his servant had not invested because he did not do anything with what he was given. Israel was meant to bring the nations, it, not just become nationalistic, I mean, you talk about church trouble. When the Lord began to fall on the Gentiles, it was church trouble. Because this is our blessing. We're the children of Abraham. You all are dogs. You're unsick, uncircumcised heathen. You're not worthy of us. And you know, the beat goes on. But God wants to use you to bless everybody. God wants to bless the Indian person you work with. God wants to bless the Muslim person you work with. God wants to bless the black, white, yellow, red, pink, green, whatever. God wants you to be a blessing to everybody. Now, I want to point out in this parable something that informs, we're informed of in the rest of the gospel. It helps us understand Jesus' perspective of, of, of why people rejected him. And it's found in this statement, we do not want this man to reign over us. And Jesus repeats it again at the end of the parable. And he says, as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. It's interesting to think about this statement in, that in the first century of Rome, it's nothing like America, to, uh, 21st century or Western uh, society, the rest of the world. In our minds in, in America and Western thought, Kings are tyrants, they're dictators, and they're elitists. They have solid gold toilets. 
Everything's over the top at the expense and on the backs of the poor. We don't want a king. <laughs> but in the first century, a king is exactly what you wanted. And the reason you wanted one was first, from a religious standpoint, people really believed that kings were the channel through which God would bring blessing. Number two, from a political standpoint, if your king was on the throne, it meant that your enemy's king wasn't. So they wanted a king. So why would the people, why wouldn't they want Jesus to reign over them? It, it wasn't because they wanted a democracy. It wasn't because they wanted a republic of God. They had waited for the kingdom of God to come. God's appointed to arrive and establish it. So it wasn't that Jesus was, was going to reign over them. It was the way in which he was going to reign over them they had a problem with. And how is he going to reign? Well, he's not coming to Jerusalem to, on a war horse with chariots and an army. That's a problem. He's riding on a donkey with ragtag peasants. In fact, this had even been prophesied about the Messiah in Zechariah 9.9. 9. They knew this. Look at the scripture. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming. Righteous and having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey. They all knew. This was known by everybody. But how he acted once he entered Jerusalem just befuddled everybody. In the first century world, you would want a king who was noble. You would want a king who was strong. You would want a courageous king. You would want a fearless king. You'd want a proud king. But you wouldn't want a humble one. Humility is frankly not what we look for in leaders now. Just think about our own political process. I think we could safely say that a humble person did not quite win. In fact, the first century, we, we, we like heroes who are confident. We do. We, we celebrate strength in our society. We like someone strong, courageous, mighty warrior, valiant, Bravado. We love that. It's a human craving, right? But here comes Jesus, and he's kind of none of that. He's humble. He's riding a donkey. Really? Could you not have gotten like a horse? Why a donkey? Because the prophet said he's coming on a donkey. The first century Jews seemed to want the opposite of a humble leader. And so it was with the kings of antiquity. And yet here comes Jesus. He's born in a manger. His father's a carpenter. The king who was from the little village of Bethlehem, nobody knew much about. The king who had no castle. The king who had no throne. The king who enters Jerusalem on a donkey and he exits Jerusalem on a cross. Jesus was not king to the religious leaders and not the one they wanted. And even the people who greeted him and praised him initially on Palm Sunday soon took their cues from the religious leaders. And within just a week, they realized Jesus was not the Jesus they wanted to worship. So again, my question, Grace, those of you watching podcasts or streaming, I'm asking you on Palm Sunday, 2017, which Jesus do you worship? Jews wanted their Jesus to be a mighty warrior. Why? Because it, it would benefit them. This fits in my worship series beautifully because I told you Jesus wants to be worshiped the way Jesus wants to be worshiped. And a true worshiper forgets about his own needs and gets his eyes on the one he desires. That's not what the Jews are doing on Palm Sunday. It would benefit them and it would help them. It would secure their nation. They would get these barbarians out of here. They wanted a king who would simply allow them to keep their blessing in their handkerchief. I'm speaking to the American church right now. You're too comfortable coming to church and wrapping your blessing in a hanky. You're too comfortable with church as usual. You don't understand the hatred that's raising and writhing and, and growing outside these doors. And the days to come, your little handkerchief Christianity won't make it. 
you're going to have to come out from the outer courts and get into the Holy of Holies. You're going to have to come about from a God that benefits you to a God that is your everything. That he is all you want and all you desire. And trust me, it's coming. It's coming quickly. Somebody said, you're trying to make me afraid. Not at all. It's a reality. Watch the news. Those of you who have followed the Lord afar off, stop it. Get that blessing out of that hanky. Get that handkerchief unwrapped and start sharing it with people. We're not blessed to keep a blessing. We're blessed to bless others. And the same goes for the church. Often we, the church, want a Jesus that will make our church great and a success. We want to go over here on Wilson Pike or somewhere and build a beautiful cathedral, which I do. I don't want an ugly church. May I say that? And I know some of you go, well, we just, it's just a building. No, no. If we're going to do it for God, it should be right. I don't want a square box made out of metal. I want a beautiful place that's worthy of the king. I want us to walk in the doors of it and just want to throw our heads back and our hands up, magnifying the Lord. Somebody says, oh, it's just a building. No, it's a sanctuary. Amen. And what, whatever the Lord does about how long we're here on the earth, it needs to be here as an example that someone cared enough to make it excellent for the king. Boy, that's making some of y'all mad, isn't it? I don't care. I'm tired of churches that look like malls. I'm just tired of it. You can like it if you want to. It's just my personal preference. I want to walk in there and be awed. I want to go, wow, you're a great God. You know, all the old cathedrals were designed that when you would walk through the doors, your eyes would eventually go up in a posture of worship. I'm glad we have these crosses, but we need more. We need more visual arts that declare who he is. Hallelujah. That's a side note. We're building a church if you're new. We're not going to stay back here in the theater of the Lord. <laughs> Got to hurry. I'm almost finished. I really am. Oh, I'm doing well. I'm finished. But all of the blessings God has given us will only be able to truly be kept as long as we keep giving them away. You truly don't keep the, the blessing in your pocket. It will diminish because it grows when it's given. Amen. It's like the Lord sees someone who will receive with this hand and give with this hand. He just keeps pouring more in. And suddenly it, it takes two hands. Yeah. You know, instead of this and this, now you're doing this and this. And then you have to get a shovel. Shovel, shovel, wheelbarrow, wheelbarrow. Scoop, scoop, dump truck, dump truck. Because God says, I found someone who will not keep it. They'll give it away. I found conduits who will bring heaven to earth and release it on the people. I found someone who just didn't come to an altar and prayed, but they went up from that altar to all their lost friends and said, there's a better way. Jesus loves you. He's got a plan for your life. Can I pray with you? And the Holy Ghost will strongly uphold you. The blessing that comes from God, it overflows. It, 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 it goes through and it never stops with us. Hmm, I love it. And finally, what about us individually? Who is Jesus? Who is the Jesus you began to worship when you recognize him as king? Have you ever allowed Jesus to change your expectations of him? Does your Jesus tell you to take up your cross? Because many of the first of us first believed we were pulled in by the resurrection because we were dead. We were dead in our sins. The Bible says dead. How many remembers when you were dead? You didn't know you were dead until you came in touch with life. You didn't know until you got in the presence of God that something was wrong with you. You thought you were fine. You thought this disaster of life was how it was supposed to be. And then you came into the presence of God. And something on, on the inside started coming to life again. And you started waking up. And you suddenly started feeling things you had never felt before. And you woke up and you went, oh, this is amazing. And you were attracted by the resurrection. But eventually we have to come to see this. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great missionary, said this. When Jesus calls a man, he bids him to come and die. So which Jesus do you worship? 
I want to leave you with this truth at the end of this passage. And the truth is, in the middle of this worship series, when I'm trying to teach you about worshiping the Lord, I want to say something that's very important. God really doesn't need your worship. It's important that you know that the worship we create for God does honor Him, but it truly is more beneficial to us than it is to Him sometimes. When I worship Him, I get my eyes off me, and that's beneficial to me. I'm a lot happier when I'm not micromanaging my life. I'm a lot happier when my life is bigger than my little personal issues and I get outside of it, aren't you? Is it yours? And the truth is God doesn't need our worship, but he does love it. And at the end of the passage, the Pharisees rebuked the disciples for their shouts of praise. If these are silent, the rocks will cry out. Now, we all know how the shouts turn silent and the enthusiastic crowd one by one disappear. And indeed, they had all become silent in their worship. This whole week of the Holy Week became increasingly a struggle for Jesus, the person, and the praise fell silent. So that at the crucifixion, no one in the world was worshiping God but his mother and a very few ragtag friends. How do you go from that kind of ad adulation to total loneliness? And Jesus is crucified and his, with his last breath, he cries aloud and yields up his spirit. And when Jesus said, hallelujah, it is finished. This is the cue for the rocks. Look at this. All the people had become silent, so it was time for the rocks to cry out. Look at this scripture. And immediately, Matthew 27, 51, and immediately after Jesus died, behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. I tell you the truth, if you're silent, Jesus said, the rocks are going to cry out. At the cross, nobody's worshiping. When Jesus says this is finished, the rocks kick in. I leave you with this this morning. Are you going to worship the Jesus of the crowds or the Jesus of the rocks? Are you going to worship the crowd, worship with the crowd on Palm Sunday as they, Hosanna, blessed is he? Are you going to be the rocks when everybody else is silent? I'm going to join in with these rocks and I'm going to worship the king of the cross. My deliverer, my savior. And that's what Palm Sunday is about. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord.